Hi Year 11, today we're going to talk about metallic bonding and how this influences the properties of metals. So you will need your structure and bonding booklet and we'll be looking at page 18 today. So I'm going to share my screen with you and let's get started. Okay, so we've spent some time talking about ionic compounds. We're moving on to our second type of compound now, and that is met the metallic bond and metals. Okay, so our learning intentions for today, we are going to learn to describe the structure of the metal in terms of what's called the electron C model. We will describe what a metallic bond is and explain how the electron C model can account for metals having high melting points, high density, malleability, ductility, luster, electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. You will know if you succeeded, if you know the meaning of the terms electron C, lattice of cations, electrostatic attraction, metallic bond, malleability, ductility and luster, and you can explain the properties of the metals in terms of the electron C model. So let's talk firstly about metallic structure. Remember, structure is the arrangement of particles. Now there are a few different models that attempt to explain the structure of metal, but the one we're going to be studying is called the electron C model. And in the electron C model, we have the metal atoms have all lost their valence electrons and become metal ions. So that's the positive circles in the diagram represent the metal ions the cations and the electrons become delocalized. So they're not actually attached to any particular atom anymore. They just kind of wander free. And in fact, they kind of jump from atom to atom to atom and they move around the lattice and they're not actually bound by um, attraction to any individual atom. So that's the electron C model. There are lots of ways people try to explain this on paper. It's real. It's it's a very abstract concept. Uh, it's very difficult to explain it on paper. So we have various ways. Uh, my my particular favourite is the um, bottom right one, where we have a swarm of electrons. But there are all different ways that you might see that being explained. The way I like to think about it is that the lattice of cations is like if you packed oranges really neatly in a box and let's pretend for a second that that box does not have a hole in the side of it and if you poured water in to fill up the box so that every bit of space in between those oranges was filled up with water the water would represent the electrons and that's what the electron C model is trying to say. You've got this lattice of metal ions, and that would be what the oranges represent in the box. And then every bit of space all around those metal ions is just completely filled with electrons. Okay, electrons are moving pretty fast, so we consider them to be you know, filling up all the space all the time. So that's what the electron C model of a metal is like. But how are you going to respond to that question? Describe the structure of a metal. Okay. So you would say a metal consists of a lattice of metal cations about which flows a sea of delocalized valence electrons. So that's the statement that's going to get you the big tick in tests and exams. So learn that one. The, all the other stuff, oranges in boxes and so forth, is great for trying to visualise how that might be. But that on the screen right now is the statement that I want you to make if you're asked to describe the structure of a metal. All right, what about bonding? Remember, bonding is the forces that hold the particles in their structure. So we're talking about why. Why should the metal cations form a lattice. They're all positively charged. Surely you would expect them to just sort of fly apart through with forces of repulsion, but they don't. 
because the electrons are filling all that space in between and those negatively charged electrons are actually kind of shielding the positives from each other. And of course, the lattice of cations is positively charged and the sea of electron, electrons is negatively charged. And that means that the opposite charges are going to attract and that's what holds this entire structure together. And that is called the metallic bond. So if you're asked to describe the metallic bond, the bit in blue there, the metallic bond is the electrostatic attraction between the lattice of metal cations and the sea of delocalized valence electrons. That's the statement that we need to see if you're asked to describe the metallic bond. All right, so how does, that ex how does this model of a metal explain the properties that we observe of metals? First of all, let's go through. There's a few words that you might not be familiar with. Um, first of all, luster. Luster refers to the way that the metal reflects light. Malleability. Malleability and ductility are very similar property. Uh, malleability is the ability to be shaped without breaking it. So you can bend a metal without breaking it. And ductility is the ability to be drawn out into a thin wire. Okay, so you can roll and roll and roll um, a metal and draw it out into a thinner and thinner and thinner wire. And that's the property we call ductility. So just so that we know what, the, what we're referring to when we talk about those properties as we go through and explain them all. All right, luster. Okay, luster, remember, it talks about the, the um, way that the metal reflects light. So metals are shiny, but they shine in a really specific way. It's sort of sparkly and reflective. In fact, it's, other things shine as well. Plastic and glass, they're shiny as well but it's a very different type of shine. You know if you're looking at metal, you know immediately by the way it shines that something's made of metal, and that is the metallic luster. I've got a few pictures there. Famous sculpture in Chicago called The Bean. People love to take photographs of the reflection of Chicago and themselves in The Bean. Of course, we have jewelry. We've got a piece of gold jewelry there, and we can see that particular metallic shine there. And I've got a polished ball of alfoil. I love this one. You can actually screw up a ball of alfoil and polish the surface and get it to look like that. I've never been patient enough to try that for that long, but apparently it can be done. Uh, so that's what we talk about when we talk about the metallic luster, that particular shininess. So let's use the electron C model to explain why metals have that particular shininess. So when light actually falls on the surface of a metal, you've got those electrons moving around the lattice and they can absorb that light and re-emit it. So it's like uh, they, it's like those little electrons are constantly flashing. So that constant flashing, that re-emission of light um, that occurs is what gives it that sparkly shininess. And uh, the surface of the metallic crystal, because the lattice is so orderly and so well packed it makes the surface very smooth so you end up having metals giving a reflection and it's a very regular reflection because of the smoothness of the surface but that sparkly shininess is due to the electrons um, you'll see in textbooks it says that they reflect light but technically they're sort of absorbing and re-emitting it so that is why metals have that luster Moving on, malleability and ductility. Remember, malleability was the ability to be shaped without breaking, and ductility was the ability to be drawn out into a wire. And both of those properties depend on you being able to change the shape of the metallic lattice without it breaking. Now, we saw when we're doing ionic compounds that if you um, put a force on the metal, a big enough force on the ionic lattice, it brought like charges together, and that caused the ionic substance to shatter. Well, it doesn't happen that way for metals. And that is because of those mobile electrons. Remember, the electrons are kind of like a fluid in between those ions. And they're shielding those ions from, from those positive charges from coming in contact with one another. So I've got my one atom sized hammer again on my lattice, and I'm going to actually hammer that metal and change the shape of its lattice. 
And even if I do that, those electrons are a constant present flowing around the ions and you never get light charges then coming in contact. So you can shape that metal lattice any way you like and the electrons will just flow with it. And that's why metals can be bent without breaking and they can be pulled out into thin wires. So the bit in blue is the bit that you say in a test or exam if you get asked to explain malleability or ductility. All right, density. Now, you know metals vary in density. You know that aluminium is much lower density than lead. Lead is high density. In fact, when you were in year eight, you did a whole experiment where you looked at the density of lots of different metals and you found that they're all different. However, generally we say they're high density uh, in the way that they're not gases and not liquids. So they're quite dense materials. And that's because of that very orderly way that the metal ions pack into the lattice. It's actually called close packing. And there are different ways that close packing can occur. There's cubic close packing and hexagonal close packing. But for the purposes of explaining density, it's the close packing of the lattice causing the cations to be as close as they possibly can. And that just means you fit more stuff into the same particular volume. And of course, that gives you a higher density. All right, metals have high melting temperatures. They're still high. Again, they're solids at room temperature, except for mercury. And you know that makes the, we say they have a high melting temperature. It's not as high as ionic compounds. You know, ionic compounds generally need thousands of degrees to melt them. Some metals melt you know, at very low temperature, in fact, cesium melts just in the palm of your hand, not that you would put it in the palm of your hand, or it would be extremely reactive and give you a very nasty burn. But if you had a vial of, of um, cesium, sorry, and I have, seen, I have seen a vial of cesium when I went to the Peter Wuthers lecture at ANU once, he had a vial of cesium. And just if you hold that vial in your hand, just, the heat from your hand is enough to melt cesium. Of course, some metals like tungsten um, have very high melting temperatures. So there's quite a range. Generally, metals um, melt at lower temperatures than ionic compounds, but of course there are some metals that have higher melting temperatures than some low melting ionic compounds. It's a real range. But the metallic bond is one of the very strong primary forces. You remember in the last video, we talked about the fact that there were three types of bonding that were strong primary forces. That was ionic, metallic, and covalent. But metallic bonds are not quite as strong as ionic bonds. And that means that metals have lower melting points than ionic compounds. Both of these types of compounds are based on uh, three-dimensional lattice structures. So we can compare them quite easily. So all of the cations in the lattice are positive and all of the electrons are negative. And that attraction of all of those positives for all of those negatives is quite strong and you're still gonna need a large amount of energy to overcome it and shake the atoms around enough that they come out of their lattice positions. So generally melting points are high. In fact, they're higher for metals with higher valences because there are higher charges. So you've got a stronger force of attraction, but it's just a general trend. There are of course other factors that affect the force of attraction between charges and things like distance between them. So it's just a general trend. Again, bit in blue is the bit, if you're asked to explain why metals have high melting temperatures, the bit in blue is what you write down. All right, thermal conductivity, they conduct heat. Metals are really, really good at conducting heat. And you know, the reason is um, twofold. One of them is that close packing of the lattice means that vibrations can be passed on quite easily through the lattice. But mostly it's the fact that the electrons are delocalized and mo constantly moving around the lattice. So if you heat one end of a metal, you're going to give extra kinetic energy to those delocalized electrons and they're going to be zipping around the lattice. They're going to collide with other electrons and they're going to collide with cations in the lattice. And that's all going to pass on kinetic energy. 
So this happens really quite quickly in a metal because those electrons are zipping around the lattice so fast and they can carry that extra kinetic energy with them and pass it on to other parts of the lattice. Electrical conductivity. Now we talked a lot about electrical conductivity in our last video and you might remember that there were two conditions that you had to satisfy for something to be conducting electricity. First of all there had to be charged particles and those charged particles had to be able to move. Now in a metal it doesn't matter whether a metal's solid or liquid, you've got those mobile valence electrons. Okay, they're zipping around in the lattice and so if you put a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other side of a metal, as in you attach it to a battery, then you're going to draw the electrons toward the positive terminal of the battery. And that will happen whether the metal is solid or liquid. So metals always conduct electricity and that is because the delocalized electrons are free to move through the metal and so applying that potential difference is going to cause a flow of electrons. All right, that's all we've got for today. So that is the properties of metals. I hope you've enjoyed your study this week and I will see you in the next video.